West of the Old Onyonyoki Group Ranch is the Ololsokut Conservancy in the Masai Mara, Narok County, managed by Leonard Kinata. In the past, we were, we were experiencing a lot of droughts because maybe our purposes of, uh, I can say, climate change and also uh, leading to uh, rainfall variations. Therefore, in the past, like 2019, 20, 2018, we were experiencing a lot of drought. So the conservancy came up with a grazing plan where it has divided the conservancy into uh, three grazing zones. Eh? So we have zone A, which is the core area between the, the, the river Mara and the escarpment. And we also have that uh, zone B between the escarpment and this main road, and zone C from the, uh, the road to the, the, the other boundary of the conservancy at the other end. So basically, these are the grazing zones which were planned by the conservancy for purposes of grazing the livestock. So we have a planned grazing model which ensures that we have enough pasture for the conservancy throughout the year. We have natural grass, they just grow naturally. So basically, we are just using an approach of conserving the grass, creating grass banks for purposes of uh, uh, livestock and also wildlife. Because uh, grass, grass is everything. Without the grass, you don't have the wildlife. Without the grass, you also don't have the livestock. That is one problem solved. But according to Kinata, several other challenges have arose. Some of the challenges which is being faced by the conservancy is problems like uh, livestock diseases, especially the diseases which are being transmitted by uh, wildlife to livestock. So such diseases include uh, tri trypanosomiasis, which is caused by uh, sesame flies. As you can see, the conservancy is so bushy, so there is a lot of invasion of sesame flies in the area. So basically, these uh, sesame flies attack uh, uh, livestock, causing the diseases. So we also have a problem of um, uh, East Coast fever, which is caused by ticks from the wildlife to the, to the livestock. So basically, those are some of the challenges. We also have uh, problems of uh, these uh, diseases such as uh, the lumpy skin disease. Uh, we have the, um, the lumpy skin disease. We also have uh, diseases like the anthrax. So those are some of the diseases which are in foot, of uh, foot and mouth. So the problem of sesame flies, they are, they, okay, the conservancy uh, is uh, partnering with partners like government, government agencies like Kentec in, uh, in setting up of uh, sesame traps. So especially in this zone A, because this zone A of the conservancy, the sesame traps are being set uh, throughout the, uh, along this escarpment so that when the sesame flies come from the zones to, to these settlement areas, it can be captured by these sesame, tra uh, sesame traps. So the Kentec has set up uh, sesame traps along this escarpment so that uh, it can counter the invasion of sesame flies to the livestock. A looming disaster that has been poorly reported and at times neglected is the loss of biodiversity in the grass and rangelands. Like many areas globally, invasive species in the dry forest and rangelands have been introduced both intentionally and accidentally and are damaging the natural and man-made ecosystems. In East Africa, and particularly Kenya, pastoralists have been adversely affected by disasters registered in many communities. In Laikipia County, Nabunga Conservancy, a pricky enemy looms. Invasive species, which is the, the cactus which we have, which is uh, a Yupuntia family. One is that it invades the land and the other plants cannot sprout under it. Scientifically, it's called a little fatty. But now when it, it has that effect, it means that other gra grasses or other plants will not grow under it. Um, but the biggest issue is that also to control it becomes a problem. One is succulent, that means it has a lot of water, it cannot be burnt. The other thing is even if you cut it and you want to take it somewhere else, it is going to grow in that other somewhere else. So it becomes dearly a problem to the environment and also, also a problem to the, the livestock because when it's taken by livestock because of the spines, they affect the mouth and the, the digestive system of the, of the animals, lastly they die. Also human, you cannot pass through there because you will, be, you will get the spines and you feel some pain behind there.
Back in Kajiado, Prosopis juliflora, commonly known as the Madenge tree, has brought untold suffering to the pastoral communities. According to a report by the Kenya Forest Research Institute, Carefree, the plant was introduced in Kenya in the 1970s, among other species from South America, to rehabilitate the arid and semi-arid areas due to its resilience, fast growth rate, and its many uses for fodder, honey production, shade, windbreaking, firewood, building poles, among others. On establishment, the tree aggressively invaded areas of indigenous vegetation and manifested negative impact on rural landscapes as well as on human and livestock health. Mazenge, we have been actually telling the government to take a part to kill Mazenge because it has actually ruled the community uh, grasses. So, but they are not doing anything. So we have just decided to come with uh, those people who, can, who have the capacity to cut and make it uh, charcoal and go and sell. But it's not working at like uh, what we, we expected. Because those people were, but is that they cut the stem and leave, leave the kind of another tree that is just on the ground. In less than a month or even two, it is sprouts and even half more than if maybe you cut one uh, branch or maybe one stem, you end up having maybe more than 10 in one in one. So you even having that, you are not even, you are doing nothing at the end of the day. So uh, the government is only having the capacity to finish the mazenge that we have around. Because of the, the way you can see, even the road that the government even trying to open a road for even people to pass because there is no, may, may I live from the other side. If you can cross this side and go to my home, you don't. You have to take go around because you can't. You don't have any way to go through. So that's the problem that we are having now. As Mazenge, we are making charcoal. We are fencing our bombers, but still it's not helping at all. Yes. Okay. It affects livestock. One, many of our livestock now, livestock now don't have teeth because uh, the way it is ve the, the the seeds are very very strong enough. So when those weak animals, uh, maybe sometimes when they are young, like the kids and the small uh, goat, when they eat, they have to remove them. And sometimes when it is removed, there is no replacement. I don't know why. And those uh, old uh, cows and old sheep and goat, when they eat as well, it is removed there. Only those medium ones can survive with the, in eating, but the uh, time whereby they lost their uh, teeth and also uh, the 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 the, what do we call, the spike when it maybe uh, what do we call those dons when it get into the body the harm and sometimes even make the the cow sheep very uh, a bit lame and extent that even you find the leg will not even step on the ground again it it is just limp all the time because it I don't know it has that kind of poison that can affect the body. So that's the big challenge that we have with the Mazenge towards our last stop. Yes. Calro, in conjunction with several other partners, have been working on various methods and technologies to find viable solutions to some of these challenges. At the Beef Research Center in Lanet, Nakuru County, their core mandate is the genetic improvement of Boran cattle breed as well as crossing it with other beef breeds like the Sahiwa. Those crosses, sometimes they can even perform better than the, uh, than the Boran themselves, especially on meat production. Because one thing, their body frame is large. I think you have to get time to see them. They are large, some of them, they are larger than even the Borans themselves. But one of the things I have to mention on the improvement of Boran, genetic improvement of Boran, you can see the way these animals are. One thing, they have very high feed conversion uh, efficiency. Another thing is that uh, uh, they have very high growth rate. What I mean is that uh, if you look at those animals behind me, the one you can see, the oldest is about uh, five and a half years. Uh, the other one, uh, which is nearer to that, is about four years. The others are about uh, three years. So uh, the old, that one, the, the bigger one, 
is weighing almost 700 kgs. Another one is weighing about uh, five, uh, about 600 kgs. The smaller ones are weighing about 400 to 450 kgs. So comparing with their age, you can see they have very high feed efficiency, uh, uh, conversion efficiency. And that is what we are looking for. What the conservancy is doing through the livestock program is uh, management of herds through two, in two phases. One is breeding and also another one is fattening, maybe for, for uh, purposes of profit making and income generation. So when it comes to breeding, the conservancy is uh, uh, advising members to, to go for uh, good breeds or quality breeds of cattle, especially the sirewals and the, and the, and the borans. So basically the, the conservancy has a breeding herd uh, and also they have bulls for breeding which are distributed to the members for breeding purposes, especially for boran. So the, uh, the conservancy is also partnering, partnering with Calro for the provision of artificial insemination, especially for the sirewal breeds of cattle. And so far, it is going, it's going good. The center also deals with the improvement of pastures and fodder for both beef and dairy production and receding the depleted rangelands. Richard Kenana showcases several varieties that have been developed to suit different parts of the country. This one we call it, this is Katumani variety. It is good for those areas of Katumani, the, 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 those areas of Katumani. It is good for for, for those areas. They grow very well and they adapt to those areas. They were specifically uh, bred for those areas. And these ones are very good for animals because you can either feed them directly or you can cut and dry and make hay and conserve for the dry season. So these are very good grass. It is doing well in Kenya and it's a very good one for conservation. This one we call Extosi. This is a variety that was bred in the coastal area. It is for the coastal areas. And it is a variety that is doing well in the coastal area. And it, it spreads very well. It covers the ground very well. And also the yields are very good. It can yield up to 200 bales per hectare. This is an Elmba Rhodes. It's also a Rhodes family. It's a variety from, for, for Rhodes. This is also a very good one. It's just the way I explained to the other ones. You can conserve the same way, we can utilize the same way for livestock. So now, we, when you go to the rangelands, this is a variety that we call Enteropogon microstatus or bush rye. This is a, a variety that is just in the bush. It is indigenous in the food, in, in the, it, it's, in the, it's found in those rangelands. They are indigenous to those areas. And it's a very good variety because it seeds well in fact, they are being used to seed those rangelands that have already been destroyed. So there is a project that has been done which involves reseeding these ones. You take the seeds and then you take it back to the fields. It's a very delicate balance to make sure that man, uh, livestock and wildlife survive. Note that these three are growing in terms of population, but the land mass remains the same. And on top of that are the effects of climate change. So basically what we are trying to say is, no grass and the three have no chance.